Well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the next in the series of the Royal College of Pathologists Implementation Guideline, Guideline Webinars. I'm Peter Johnston and I am still 16 days short of being the, or still 16 days within being the Vice President for Professional Practice in the Royal College of Pathologists. And I'm really pleased to be here to present this to you today. Um, this data set uh, is about the reporting of renal tumours in childhood. And we're very grateful to Professor Gordon Vyanichka. I'm so sorry, Gordon. Gordon Vyanichka. I could say this beforehand. Vyanichka, Vyanichka, um, who's going to talk to you today um, uh, about these webinars, which he and his colleague Neil Sabir have written. <clears throat> so before we start, just a couple of... Um, housekeeping rules um just to let you know that the webinar um will last approximately 15 minutes long gordon's talk will followed by about 20 minutes thereafter of questions and answers please submit your questions and answers using the q a button at the bottom of the screen and we will pass these on um for discussion so without further ado i would like to start off again by welcoming gordon and asking him to present um, to you all. Thank you very much, Gordon. There we go. Uh, well, thank you very much for hosting this uh, webinar, which is, as you said, on the data set for renal tumors. Uh, the, the data set was prepared by my colleague, uh, Nils Sebire and myself. We've been working on this for many years, actually, uh, and data sets are, are not a new thing in pathology. I think that uh, our college started it first, but uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I know that the, in the college we, we started in 2005, uh, actually with this idea of having data sets for cancer reporting. And I know that there are data sets also produced by the Royal College of Australasia and the uh, College of American Pathologists. And in 2014, the ICCR group was formed uh, with the idea of actually uh, doing these uh, data sets for all sorts of cancers. And the idea for that is obviously to standardize their reporting so that people don't miss something which is important in, in their reports. And I think it's really good idea because then we, we have a better opportunity to study these tumors in sort of systematic way because they are all reported according to the same uh, uh, criteria and parameters. Uh, in the UK, we are following, in, in pediatric renal tumors, there are two big uh, groups which are studying these tumors. One is International Society of Pediatric Oncology, uh, or SIOP, which is followed in about 85% of the world, uh, because not only in Europe, but also in uh, South America, Africa, Asia, uh, these countries are following SIOP approach. These approaches uh, have dif uh, different, but nevertheless, they have very, uh, very similar results. So it's actually, a matter of preference, if you like, which one you want to follow. Uh, but because they are different, it's difficult, it's difficult to, uh, to sort of uh, cover them in one data set, which is what ICCR tried to do. And I think uh, they made a mistake because I saw the preliminary uh, provisional uh, draft of the, of the data set. And it's actually not uh, very helpful because it's very confusing. That if you don't know what is what, you don't know whether you're following American or our protocol. Uh, uh, and as I said, th th there are many differences which are important for classification and staging. Uh, Wim's tumor, according to the SIO protocol, is diagnosed on imaging. So there is no preoperative uh, pre chemotherapy biopsy required unless there are some clear indications why they should be done, but normally diagnosis is made on imaging. Uh, then preoperative chemotherapy is given, followed by surgery and pathological assessment. What's important to know is that uh, in renal tumors, still pathology is the main, uh, pro, uh, mo main uh, factor in deciding about treatment. Molecular biology is actually still not taken into account for uh, stratification of these tumors. So it, it really ba it, it's based on our assessment. Uh, we have to decide what histological type the tumor is, and then obviously what stage it is. In very rare cases, tumor volume is uh, also used for stratification, but there are like 2% of similar such cases, and there is no molecular marker which is being used yet. There are some markers which are being investigated, but it's still not 
uh, used for stratification. Our role, as uh, in, in all other things, is to make diagnosis, to say very clearly which histological type of the tumor it is, uh, which risk group it is, and to, to obviously assign abdominal stage. If, if the if tumor is uh, metastatic in the lungs or whatever, we don't get that. So we, we can only say local abdominal stage is stage three, for example, but uh, a clinician will know that it's actually overall stage four because of distant metastasis. So it's still the, the basically backbone of treatment of children is pathology. Data set uh, need to, uh, to include a number of uh, so-called core and non-core uh, uh, items, which are very helpful actually in, in diagnosis. For example, patient's age, uh, renal tumors of childhood show very striking age distribution. So for example, if you have a tumor which looks like a mesoblastic nephroma, say one of these tumors, and the child is four or five, it's 100% not, because the mesoblastic nephroma does not occur after the age of three. So knowing the age is actually very helpful. So if you are looking at something and think, oh, this could be this tumor, you better check whether the tumor falls into the age, uh, age range where these tumors are described. Uh, obviously, other things are also important, surgical procedure, whether it's total or partial nephrectomy, which side the tumor is, whether preoperative chemotherapy was given or not, whether the biopsy was done prior to uh, treatment uh, because uh, open biopsy upstage the tumor to stage three, but fine needle aspiration biopsy and true cut biopsy don't. Whether there is uh, uh, information about pre or intraoperative rupture, because that's also uh, important for staging, and whether a surgeon tells you that the lymph nodes were sampled or not. So these are all important uh, uh, bits of uh, data set which actually you should know before you even start looking at the tumor. Then uh, you move to what uh, our job is, which is actually to describe the tumor uh, as we sample it. We have to say whether the tumor is unifocal or multifocal because they are, they are, uh, they are assessed differently. Here you have tumor which shows three nodules, one, two, and smaller nodule here. And it's important to uh, sample them all in the same fashion so you can assess all of them. You have to measure the tumor because it's important for uh, assessing or calculating tumor volume, which again may be important in some cases, and whether you can see macroscopic evidence of invasion. When you have an effective specimen, basically you do what uh, we are used to do, which is to weigh, measure, take a picture, ink the surface of the specimen, because it's very important to, uh, to know, you know where, where the external margins are. If you see something which looks like a possible rupture, then you should really use different color and make a note that uh, ink used was black, except in the area which looked uh, suspicious where you used, I don't know, green, green ink. Uh, if, if there are lymph nodes, you have obviously to sample them separately. You have to take resection margins of the renal vein, renal artery, and so on. And uh, what you need to do, which, which is very important, is to have a, a, a block key identif identification. It's really a critical uh, step in, in assessment of renal tumors. You really, or renal tumors, you need to know which block is coming from which side. Without that, you may be in trouble understanding the relationship with, uh, with the resection margins, with the renal sinus, and, and so on. And inking is equally important because that is the most uh, sort of uh, reliable parameter to tell you whether what you're looking at are resection margins or not. Uh, then you end up with a set of slides, which could be anything between 25 and, uh, I don't know, 70, 80, 90, depends how big the tumors are. What is required according to the protocol is to have at least one slice of the tumor completely blocked, like here. You can have more if you want, but one is required as a minimum. By looking at so many slides, you are actually uh, faced with the difficult task, which I'm going to come in a minute. Uh, but here is just, again, summary of, of these core uh, data that we want to have in, uh, in our report, which is a, a nephrectomy weight, location of the tumor, blocky identification, percentage of necrosis, macroscopically and histologically, 
the, certain findings such as anaplasia and so on and so on. That's all actually described in the in the protocol, so there is no need to go to, to every single one of them. But it's really important that uh, we have all these data uh, recorded and, and then we will end up with the correct diagnosis, hopefully. Uh, as I said, uh, dealing with these tumors is not an easy task because uh, you have to take into account many, many things. You have to assess a percentage of uh, non-viable tumor or necrosis or chemotherapy-induced changes. At the same time, you have to assess uh, percentage of viable components, blastema, epithelial, and stromal component. You have to look for anaplasia, and if you find it, you have to decide whether it's uh, focal or diffuse. Uh, and then, then you also have to uh, think about uh, tumor spreading. We, we will count that in a minute. But the, the protocol for dealing with these tumors uh, is described in the paper that we published when the, the study which we are now uh, in started. Uh, it started actually in 2019, although it's called 2016 because there was a delay in launching it. And then on the basis of that, you, we have to subclassify tumor uh, into risk groups. Uh, low, intermediate, or high risk groups. That's very important because these uh, these groups uh, have different treatment and they have very different prognosis and outcomes. Some people, if, if you don't like writing, uh, you know, long reports saying uh, there are this many, oh, the, the percentage of uh, chemotherapy due change and so on is this much and so on, it's perfectly fine to use uh, this uh, pro forma, which is actually part of, uh, of this uh, data set. You can just tick boxes. It's equally okay. It's important to, to have assessment. And here you can see that all these uh, things that we mentioned previously are listed. Tumor weight, size, uh, location, whether the tumor is focal, multifocal or not, and so on. So it's not, and, and many people actually uh, now use this form rather than writing long reports. It's, I, I suppose it's easier to do that. And here again, uh, further components of, of this uh, pro forma, which basically take into account all important uh, bits which are important for subclassification and for staging. In your report, uh, what's important, obviously, that you conclude, that your conclusion is crystal clear, that you cannot leave ambiguity in your report because further treatment is going to be based on your report. So you have to say very clearly what sort of tumor it is. Is it film's tumor? Is it clear cell sarcoma? Is it raptoid tumor? Metanetric adeno oh, sorry, uh, mesoblastic nephroma or whatever type. For other tumors, it's not important to subtype them. Uh, it's only for Wilms tumor that we need to know which subtype it is. So on the basis of uh, your assessment, you have to say, okay, this is Wilms tumor. It is a regressive type. You, say, you have to remind, if you like, clinician which risk group it is, intermediate risk, and what stage it is, and the reason for staging. So you, you say due to renal sinus invasion or due to non-viable lymph node metastasis, and so on. Sometimes people... Uh, sort of uh, get carried away by seeing some unusual features in the tumor, and then they start bringing in uh, uh, terms which actually are, should I say, meaningless, or at least uh, they don't exist in any formal classification of this tumor. So there are some tumors which are very, very rich in rhabdomyoblasts. They show very strong uh, rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. And in, if you look through the literature, there are papers describing so-called fetal rhabdomyomatose Wilms tumor. Actually, it's a misnomer. It's just stromal Wilms tumor. And this fetal rhabdomyomatose is just one type, subtype, if you like, of, skill, of a stromal Wilms tumor. Or some people describe botryoid Wilms tumor. Botryoid is not subtype. It's a pattern of growth of, of uh, Wilms tumor into empty space, usually in the renal pelvis. Or teratoid Wilms tumor, which again, uh, is a tumor which shows very uh, um, very prominent uh, heterologous differentiation re resembling teratoma. And that's why like 40 years ago, some people coined the term teratoid Wilms tumor, but it does not exist in any classification. It has no prognostic or therapeutic consequences and such tumors should not be called something which is uh, meaningless to clinicians. If you send this report to clinicians saying this is teratoid Wilms tumor, they, they will not know what to do with that tumor. You have to tell them 
you know, precisely which risk group it is. And then on the base of that, they'll be able to treat these tumors. So all these uh, components of, of data sets are important uh, in reaching the right uh, diagnosis and uh, re uh, subtyping the tumor and assigning the accurate stage. As I said, post-operative treatment of this tumor is based in inclusively, uh, exclusively, sorry, on, on pathology. There are no other uh, prognostic factors which are taken into account, such as age or whatever else. So we are still in this particular area, uh, people who actually decide on post-operative treatment 100%. And uh, this is just uh, to finish my presentation with a picture of Max Wilms, who is actually wrongly accredited as a person who described this tumor. First, he was a surgeon. Uh, he did his uh, habilitation thesis uh, in 1899 on uh, renal tumors, uh, but uh, he was not the first one who described this tumor. The tumor was described more than 100 years earlier in 1793, uh, but uh, somehow the tumor got uh, linked with, with him and uh, is still being used, although he never claimed that he was the first one, but uh, I guess uh, it's a nice way to rem be remembered. He died in 1918, uh, at the end of the First World War, when he actually attracted diphtheria uh, from the prisoner of war, and then he died of that. Uh, he was a very accomplished surgeon. He was professor of surgery in Heidelberg. Uh, but as I say, Wim's uh, tumor was not his area of work. He only did thesis on that and forgot about that. Uh, but then somehow later, uh, not uh, at, the, at that time, uh, it was like in 50s when the tumors start being started called Wimps tumor. So it's one of these uh, interesting stories in history how things can go in different ways for no obvious reason. So that's my short presentation, and I am very happy to answer any questions uh, if, that you might have regarding this. Thank you very much, Gordon. That was really interesting. Uh, it's a, from my point of view, as somebody who is uh, a hematopathologist, for the most of part of what I do, it was really interesting to to look at this again in a an area that I've not looked at since um, since I was much younger in my career. So thank you for that. Um, one thing, just while, while we're trying to hope that there are going to be loads of questions from the audience, um, you mentioned quite early on that molecular pathology doesn't play a role in the diagnosis of Wilms. Um, I guess that's a bit surprising in the context of most um, pediatric tumors. Um, and indeed most immature tumors. Can you if, explain why that's the case, please? Uh, yes, I mean, it, it is really in interesting that uh, although we obviously have a lot of discoveries in, in, in the molecular bi biology of uh, renal tumors and Wilms tumor as well, uh, but other tumors as well, CCSK and rhabdoid tumor and uh, metoblast nephroma. So we are learning about their molecular signature, but uh, none of these uh, findings is still uh, included in stratification of these tumors. Uh, uh, Americans actually tried to do that uh, in their previous study when they introduced two, mic um, um, two, two markers, uh, LOH, uh, uh, but the problem is that uh, they, they are present in only about 5% of cases. So therefore they are not widely applicable and therefore in, uh, in uh, Europe or in SIO, which is now more than Europe, uh, we decided that it's not actually a good marker to stratify tumors uh, because uh, you, you really don't want uh, something which is applicable to small small number of, uh, of cases. There is a more promising marker now, which again uh, was discovered at the same time on both sides of the Atlantic, if you like, which is 1Q gain, which seems to be more promising. It's present in about uh, 35 to 40 percent of cases, and there is a very clear link with the uh, outcome. Uh, and the Americans actually decided, uh, because they are about to launch a new uh, study and trial now, they decided to introduce this 1Q gain as a prognostic factor. In Europe, because we started with our study four years ago, uh, we did not include it, but we are prospectively collecting uh, data about uh, 1Q gain, and then we'll compare with the outcomes. And I'm pretty sure that in the next trial, uh, this will be finally introduced as a 
you know, whether children need more or less treatment on the basis of 1Q status. So there are a lot of uh, interesting, exciting discoveries, but for, for from practical point of view, they are not uh, still used in uh, in the SIOP studies. Yeah, thank you. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> just looking at, I'm still staring at a blank screen from the audience, and, and um, I would remind you that you know that you guys are the experts in the field, and in fact, um, you, you're the ones who should be asking questions here. And so, um, please do um, put in your questions. Um, well, well, we're well, I'm encouraging you to do that. The, the, there was a thing that interested me in, in the sampling protocol for your blocking strategy. And um, I mean, I, I spent some time looking at um, how best to sample tissues many years ago. Uh, and one of the things that, that came across then was that it was better to take um, the same number of samples from a wide area of something rather than to use, for example, a single slice of tumor. And there was evidence that people like Ewald Weibel in the in the 1960s demonstrated that was the way we should be uh, uh, using those protocols. I just wonder what the what the justification was for um, using one single slice for sampling rather than for going for you know a, a a number per volume, which is, you know, that most most of these tumors have a, a so many blocks per centimeter or so many blocks per cubic centimeter sort of thing. Um, I just wondered what the what the rationale for doing that was. Yes, uh, well, as you quite rightly say, uh, the, the sort of uh, doctrine was to take at least one block per larger centi centimeter of the tumor, but actually you end up with not enough slides because uh, for Wim's tumor. For other tumors, it's not that important. For clear cell sarcoma, rhabdoid tumor, mesovast nephroma, and so on, it's not important, but you don't know what the tumor is when you're dealing with it. So you have to assume it's a Wilms tumor. Uh, and for Wilms tumor, because it's so heterogeneous tumor, which contains so many different components, which can be present in any proportion, uh, you really need to have uh, you know, a lot of slides in order to have some sort of uh, reliable assessment. So if you end up, if you have a tumor, which is, I don't know, 15 by 10 by 10 centimeter, and you take only 10 blocks, it's not really representative of the whole tumor. So we, after, you know, considering uh, at the same time, obviously don't want to end up, which it happens sometimes that people block the whole tumor. So uh, you, you get like 190 cases, 191 is the largest number I received uh, for reviewing it. Uh, so it, it's obviously you know time consuming both for people who are blocking and also for those who are looking at these slides. So we decided that one slice of the whole surface of the tumor should be regarded as adequate. There is, there is we have no evidence really to say that uh, oh if we had taken more slices or sampled the whole tumor histology would have been different and therefore you may end up with different uh, uh, risk group and, and so on. It's possible, but uh, this system as it is, it has been uh, you know, used since 2001 when uh, we started with, uh, with the trial at the time. And it seems to be uh, rather reliable because we can see really very clear difference in, uh, in outcomes of tumors which are classified as low, intermediate and high risk. And obviously they are treated very differently. So it's very important uh, to, to know really where to put the tumor. Well, thank you. <clears throat> there is a question in, thanks very much, which is about immunocytochemistry. Uh, and the, the question is, could you discuss please what the role, if any, for immunocytochemistry in renal tumor workup is? Yeah, it, it's also a very good question. Uh, and uh, again, in Wilms tumor, funny enough, immunocytochemistry is not that critical. The diagnosis and everything is still based on histology, on H and D. E. So we are like 19th century pathologists in this particular area where everybody else is moving towards immunocytochemistry and obviously molecular biology. But for Wilms tumor, just a set of H and D e slides and you should really reach diagnosis. Uh, there are obviously cases where you have to uh, use immunocytochemistry, especially in so-called uh, monophasic tumors, because classical Wilms tumor contains three components, uh, stromal, epithelial, and blastemal component. And in such cases, diagnosis is easy. You don't really need 
anything, you can look at three slides and say, yes, this is Wilms tumor. The problem is that number of them have only one component, say blastema component, which is basically undifferentiated component, which looks exactly the same as uh, Ewing sarcoma or some other small round blue cell tumors. And in such cases, yes, you need immunocytochemistry in order to exclude other tumors rather than confirm there is no marker which is specific for Wim's tumor. In Wim's tumor, you can see all sorts of uh, markers being positive, starting with WT1, but it's positive in 80% of cases. So 20% of cases are negative. So if you have negative WT1, it doesn't mean tumor is not actually Wim's tumor. So then you have to bring other markers like CD56, CD57, uh, PAX8, and so on and so on. So immunocytochemistry does have a role, but it's not critical. It's, it's important only for cases which are difficult, uh, and the majority of them are not difficult. The majority of them are really relatively straightforward uh, uh, cases to say, yes, this is Wim's tumor or not. Difficulties come when you start subtyping uh, it. But to make a diagnosis, you know, uh, in, uh, should I say, maybe 80, 85% of cases, it's a straightforward H and D diagnosis without immunocytochemistry. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I guess the, the, the other immunocytochemistry you would use is the, the ones just to exclude other types. But again, that, that's something that um, I find myself a little bit uneasy about because when do you stop doing the immuno if you start looking at for what it's not when it's glaringly obvious what it is? <clears throat> so the, there's no real point. Which it, and I think that's a useful point to make <clears throat> is that when a, when the diagnosis is obvious on an H &E, there really isn't any point in, in throwing resources at it that aren't going to take you any further down the line, because um, that's the only thing it can be. So that, that's very, very helpful. Um, so uh, again, we're, we're lacking questions. So um, for, for the benefit of, of the audience, Gordon and I had a, a conversation beforehand, and we, we talked about... Um, the, the system and process that's there to enable accurate and appropriate treatment for children with Wilms tumour. And part of that is around the making the accurate diagnosis, which is what this is about. And part of it is about the, the way in which we can provide external quality assurance, if you like, around about that diagnostic process. And uh, Gordon, would you like to outline, please, the nature of the central review, which forms a useful part of the diagnostic process to ensure that we treat patients appropriately? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, that, that's really uh, something which is very, very important in, uh, in, in the, uh, it's important in any, any area, I guess, but in uh, renal tumors of childhood, we actually have a system which has been going on for many years, actually from the first trial, which started in 69 in the US and 71 in Europe, uh, uh, central pathology review was introduced as, as something which is required, as in any other trial, in any other tumor. You really need uh, an expert to tell you, uh, you know, which tumor you're dealing with and which stage, and then you can analyze. But for many, many years, it, it was retrospective. So it did not influence out uh, treatment, sorry. Uh, however, over the years, we realized that actually there is a significant discrepancy between institutional pathologists and central pathology reviewer. And, and uh, in American and the uh, SIOP studies, this discrepancy was uh, in the region of 20%, which is considerable percentage of cases. And, and obviously, they, they were treated according, according to the institutional diagnosis and stage, which later proved to be wrong. And as a result of that, the, these children were treated uh, wrongly, you know, for tumor which they did not have or for the stage which they, they did not have. So some were over-treated, some were under-treated. When in 2001, we were about to launch a new trial, we decided in the UK, uh, it was not the case in the rest of the SIO because it's actually not an easy process to, to follow, but we decided to try to introduce so-called rapid central pathology review so that the cases are sent to uh, Central Pathology Reviewer, which happened to be me, uh, plus uh, Neil Sebire and Dana Kelsey, who were on the panel at the time. And, and the post-operative treatment uh, waited until these tumors were seen by, uh, by Central Pathology Reviewer and reported. And only then they, 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 they will start with post-operative treatment. That proved to be actually 
a very, very good system because uh, although the discrepancy rate, strangely enough, remained very, very stubborn and stable in a region of 20 to 25 percent, even I, I did, the, not for the purpose of this uh, meeting, but for something else, I, I looked at the, at the data from the last 20 years, since 2001 until 2023, and the discrepancy rate is 18%. But none of these children now was treated wrongly because these diagnoses were institutional diagnoses which were then corrected by central pathology reviewer. And tre treatment given was according to Central Pathology Review. Uh, the cent uh, Central Pathology Review cannot work with, without institutional pathologists. It's very, very important to have good links because uh, you know it, it's institutional pathologist who is sampling the tumor, who is describing the tumor, who is telling you a lot of things which you as a Central Pathology Reviewer who has the slides cannot know or see. So I see this work as a sort of teamwork I depend on, on these uh, colleagues who are following the protocol, sampling the tumors, describing precisely what they also sharing their doubts, sending these cases. If, if we disagree, I always write very precisely why I think something is A and not B or whatever. And the system is actually proving to be working very, very well. And that's why when this new trial, which was launched in 2019, was prepared and launched, actually for the first time, a rapid central pathology review was a requirement of the trial. Now, all other countries uh, where this protocol is being followed are actually required to, uh, to have rapid reviews. So the post-operative treatment should not start without uh, experts' opinion on tumor type and tumor stage to avoid under or over treatment. And uh, that's something that is, I'm very happy to say started uh, first in the UK trials, but then spread uh, to other trials, including uh, American trials, where also it used to be retrospective, but now they also realize the benefits of, uh, of this, and they're also now doing rapid review. Yeah, that's very helpful. It puts it in context. Thanks. There's another couple of questions come in while you've been speaking, and one of them is about um, multifocal tumors, or and then the other, the two are, are both talking about um, a, the importance of um, post. You mentioned that the tumor is sometimes removed before chemotherapy, or sometimes after chemotherapy, and what the differences are there. So if we go first about looking at multifocal tumors, if you get multifocal tumors and they've got different histology and different nodules, how do you then stratify that lesion? Yeah, yes, it, it is a tricky area. And uh, actually, there is no crystal clear, actually, answer to, to that question. We, as a pathologist, we are supposed to assess each nodule separately. So if you have three nodules, for example, you say nodule one measured this much, and it showed these features. And on the basis of this feature, I classify this tumor, say, as mixed type. Nodule two, this, this is the size of the, and these are the features, and this tumor, this nodule is blastemal type. And the third nodule is, again, size and features, and I classify this tumor as aggressive type. So you have three different types in one kidney, regressive, mixed, and blastemal. Then what you should do as a patho so you write very clearly, you know, this is multifocal tumor with the following features, nodule one, regressive, nodule two, blastemal, nodule three, uh, whatever I said, uh, mixed. Then in your head, you should put these all together, uh, like merging them in, in one tumor and say, take an old, because these, tum these nodules are different size. One tumor can be, one nodule can be 10 centimeter in size, that one five centimeter and third two centimeter. So you don't want, uh, like, uh, for example, we have uh, this philosophy, if you like, of treatment that you treat the most aggressive uh, type within the tumor. So if you have teratoma and you have a yolk sac component, obviously you're going to treat it as yolk sac tumor. In Wim's tumor, it's not so simple because you don't want a child to be treated as blastemal type, which is high risk tumor, just because it has a nodule which is two centimeter in size, pure blastema, but then you have a nodule which is 10 centimeter in size where there is no blastema at all. And the third uh, nodule, which is five centimeter, which is regressive and has a little bit of blastema, a little bit of epithelium. So you sort of put these three nodules into one in your head and say, 
overall, I think this is, say, mixed type. Now, how this tumor is going to be treated is not up to pathologists, obviously. It's never up to pathologists. It's up to the uh, MDT. They have to sit and think and decide how they, and there is no clear, actually, answer to that. Uh, they usually take into account, should I say, uh, this overall assessment. But sometimes they, they may say, well, there is a lot of lastima here. That nodule is, uh, say, five centimeters in size. So I'm not com sort of uh, comfortable to ignore that amount of lastima. So we think it is better to treat it as high risk. That, that's entirely up to MDT. As a pathologist, you cannot influence. You can only say what you see, what you assess, and leave the, the treatment decision to uh, your local MDT. That's very helpful. Thank you. The other question was about chemotherapy. And so um, how do you, how do you deal with, for example, post chemotherapy um, nephrogenic rests in a pseudo capsule following treatment as opposed to residual tumor <clears throat> and the histology that might remain after chemotherapy when you get the specimen? How do we deal with those? Because that I can see could be quite a confusing um, and difficult way. Are we looking at chicken or egg here? Yeah. Yes, it's it's also a very good question and uh, well-known uh, <laughs> dilemma and nightmare, if you like, for pathologists. Uh, I always say that uh, I, if you ask me personally, I would prefer the American approach, which is when you find the tumor, take it out, give it to the pathologist, he'll tell you what uh, tumor it is, what stage it is, because th then you're looking at the tumor as it is. With PSYOP approach, where you give preoperative chemotherapy, then take the tumor out, and then it comes to the pathologist, it's more complex because preoperative chemotherapy, A, is going to kill a lot of tumor. So, and, and you may not know what was there. Secondly, it may induce the uh, maturation within the tumor, so which is well-known uh, phenomenon, if you like. Uh, and then also the, the, the finding of certain certain features in certain areas may have different significance in pre-treated cases versus non-treated cases. So it's a, that's why these tumors are so difficult. And that's why we have this problem with discrepancy rate. People don't see a lot of these tumors. These tumors are rare. There are about 120 cases per year in the UK. And there are 20 pediatric oncology centers. So on average, each center will see only six cases. And each center has between two and four, maybe five pathologists. So if you just do sort of average, each pathologist is going to see one to two cases a year. And then he or she may struggle to understand what is what and how to deal with certain features and so on. Uh, and it's not always easy actually to be certain whether what you're looking at is a genuine tumor, viable tumor, for example, especially stroma, or whether it's chemotherapy induced changes in the stroma, which is actually now dead. And, and that may actually swing your uh, assessment into whatever direction, depending on what you're looking at and what your final conclusion is. Uh, so it is, uh, chemotherapy is bringing another level of uh, complexity, if you like, in, in dealing with these tumors, making pathologist's life <laughs> even more difficult than it is. Uh, so, uh, and, and of course, as, as some dimension, uh, certain features, which, for example, in, in the American protocol are regarded as diagnostic, like the presence of the capsule around something which looks like nephrogenic rest in, in the States. If you see the capsule, that it's not, an, then they say, no, capsule means it's a tumor. Capsule does not exist with nephrogenic rest. But in SIO, when you give preoperative chemotherapy, you may have actually capsule forming under chemotherapy. And therefore, this is not the feature which will help you to decide whether something is a tumor or nephrogenic rest. So it's really chemotherapy makes our life more complicated, to put yeah, it. Indeed, and many, in many yeah. ways it does. Um, <clears throat> we've really only got a few minutes left now. And I just as a sort of two minutes um, before we wind this up, um, Gordon, um, just thinking about, do we have any insights into what the origins and why it is that Wilms tumours um, occur, um, given they're rare, but just uh, do we have any 
theories about what's happening. We, we need to finish in about five minutes. So, um, you know, j just just a, a kind of snapshot, if you will. Yeah. Well, yes, as I said, the, the, there is a lot of uh, activity, research activity in, in Vince tumor. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Vince tumor 1 gene was identified back in 1990, so 30-something years ago. Uh, and we know, and that's the only gene which has been identified so far with certainty. We know that there is almost certainly another Wim's tumor gene called Wim's tumor 2 gene, but we, it has not been identified yet. And then even with, with this one, we still know that it's not enough to explain the, uh, the, the tumor. So there must be WT3 gene somewhere. But we, we have no idea where, that, where this gene might be. Uh, so uh, we, we, we find bits and pieces, but still the big picture is missing. And we still don't know what the stem cell of Wim's tumor is. You know, it develops from, uh, you know, nephrogenic glastema. Uh, it resembles, obviously, fetal kidney and so on. So we think that something in the development of the kidney goes wrong at some point and becomes Wim's tumor. But at the same time, you have Wim's tumor in adults, rare, but they exist. And it's difficult to imagine that the same mechanism is involved in, in the formation of Wim's tumor in somebody who is, I don't know, 35. Because by if it was a fetal sort of uh, switch in, in development, it would have presented earlier, not at the age of 35. So there's still a lot, a lot of things which we don't un fully understand. We are, as I say, investing a lot of time into trying to understand what's going on and how to explain these tumors, but uh, we are still nowhere near, I think, uh, finding the, the final answer. Well, <clears throat> that, that's very reassuring in some regards because it means there's a job for us for a while yet, but um, uh, <clears throat> it, it is, it's, uh, it's a great, a great puzzle and thank you very much for that. Um, well, we're almost at time and so it's my job now to, to say thank you. So before I do that, just please everybody be aware that this um, is, as you know, being recorded and it will shortly be available on our website as a resource um, for all college fellows and members to access um, in future. Um, part of this is our ongoing attempt to increase the resources available to fellows and members on the website for use in daily practice, useful to refer back to um, for our own continuing development. Um, so thank you all for coming and participating. Thank you particularly um, to Professor Gordon. I'm not going to say it. I'm not even going to try, Gordon. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Vianic, it's not easy. It's not difficult, Vianic, to say thank you very much, Gordon Vianic, for coming and sharing your expertise with us. And um, also in, in his absence, to Neil Sabiri for all, all the work that we know he went to to try and create this. Um, so thank you all for, for, for all of that. Um, just before I close, the, the next um, webinar will be coming up in future and just look out for that. Um, as other webinars will be forthcoming related to this programme. And just to finish, I would like to just thank the guidelines team in the Royal College of Pathologists, Maria Marrero feo Cynthia Mitri, Gamzi Zen and her successor, Tadja Ritnaswaran, for doing all the work behind this, and the events team led by Kristen Pantello and Carla Clooney for all the work that's gone into producing this. I remain Peter Johnston. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>